going to hear about math and food and how math can be easy as pie. And people often say to me, why do you write a book about math and food? And the thing is that I love food and I love math. But unfortunately, most people love food more than they love math. And so I decided I wanted to share my love of math with everybody via my love of food. And because doing math is more like cooking than you might realize, because it's really about taking some basic ingredients and putting them together and then deciding if you think it's delicious. And when you're cooking in the kitchen, you know, the worst that can happen is maybe you poison yourself. But that's okay, then you'll probably recover, and then you can try again another time. And with math, a fear can grow up about being wrong. But since I've been teaching these wonderful art students just up the street, I've been finding ways to show that math isn't just about right and wrong. It's about discovery, and it's about creating things, and it's about inventing worlds in which different things can happen. And those worlds are wonderful because they don't have to be constrained by our physical world. They're only constrained by your imagination. So if you have a great imagination, then you have a great capacity for doing math but it's not usually presented like that in school, unfortunately. And so, if you didn't like math in school, I sympathize. I didn't like math in school either, actually. But I was very lucky, because my mother, who is mathematical, showed me wonderful, curious things to be excited about in math. And so I always held out hope that there was something more exciting waiting for me if I just made it through all that boring stuff at school. Some people have wonderful teachers at school, and that's great, and some people don't. And so I decided to write books to go around that system to help everyone who doesn't maybe have a mother who will show them all those wonderful mathematical things. Because I know many people have parents who are also afraid of math, and that can be passed on from generation to generation. So I hope that we can break that cycle and show that math is fun and delicious, and that it's actually for everybody. Because I truly believe that just like you can appreciate art even if you can't do it, and you can appreciate music even if you can't play, and you can appreciate food even if you don't know how to cook it, you can also appreciate math even if you can't do it yourself. And so today I'm going to show you some of my favorite mathematical structures in places that you might not necessarily think of as being mathematical. And this is going to include Bach and juggling, hair, factors of 30, that's quite mathematical, cake, and custard. But first of all, I need to tell you what math is really, so that you can see why any of these things could possibly be counted as mathematical. Because math isn't just about numbers and equations, which is the impression you might get if you think about middle school and high school math. Math is about much more than that. And I think that mathematics is the study of how things work. But it's not the study of how any old things work. It's the study of how logical things work. And it's not any old study of how logical things work. It's the logical study of how logical things work. <laughs> and the problem with that is that actually nothing behaves logically. I don't behave logically. Even possibly Lynn doesn't behave logically sometimes. The computer definitely doesn't behave logically. Uh, the piano doesn't behave logically. Things do not behave logically. And so in order to study anything logically, we have to forget the pesky details that get in the way of them behaving logically so that they do turn into things that behave logically. And in forgetting those details, we are making a move from the concrete real world into the abstract world of ideas. And that move is how you get things to work logically. Now, it can feel like you're floating around in midair when you do that, because you're not really dealing with real things anymore. And the other reason that people don't like making that move is that in the abstract world where things behave logically, you can't win arguments by yelling. And some people like winning arguments by yelling. But I don't really like winning arguments by yelling. And honestly, if I did, I would win, because I can yell very loudly. But I prefer understanding the logic inside situations in the logical abstract world. So another benefit of doing that is that when you forget details about different situations, a lot of different situations become the same. Just like if you forget the carpet and the windows and the furniture inside a, a house, a lot of different houses turn out to have the same structure deep down inside. And so when we do that, we get to study lots of different things at the same time. And that's something that we gain by doing that abstract move. 
So it can seem like you're getting further away from real life, but what you're really doing is you're be enabling yourself to study lots of things at the same time, which is good if you're lazy like me. And I like saying to my students, math comes from being lazy because you don't want to do the same thing over and over again. Instead of doing that, you build a theory that does it for you. And that's what abstract math is about. So, first of all, I'm going to talk about the math inside one of my favorite pieces of Bach. There is so much math in Bach, I could probably talk continuously for about two weeks just about that. So I won't do that, but this is taken from the two books of Preludes and Fugues that Bach wrote, The Well-Tempered Clavier. Some other math caused that to be possible because it, it had previously not been possible to write music in every key because the way they tuned instruments, some keys sounded great and some keys sounded terrible. But then they found a way of making it possible to make all the keys sound more or less all right. So Bach got really excited and he wrote a piece in every key. There are 12 notes on the piano, but he did major and minor, so that made 24. And then he got really excited and did it all over again, so that made 48. So this one is taken from the second book, and it's the one in G minor, and so I'll start by playing it for you. Thank you. Thank you. This piece, like many pieces of Bach, is written in polyphony, which means that there are several different lines of music that wind their way around each other. And if you had four people who could sing it, then you could get them to sing each line independently of each other. And when you're studying a piece in polyphony, what you often do is you play each line by itself to understand the structure of the individual melodies. So the first time I studied this piece, I tried doing that and I got really confused. So I decided to draw a picture of it. And the picture came out like this. So this black line at the top 
plots is the one that starts out at the top, but you can see that it crosses over and comes down here. The red one starts at the bottom and starts creeping its way up. And once I drew this picture, I understood why I was confused. And if you understand why you're confused about something, that's the first step to becoming unconfused about it. And the reason I was confused is because these lines cross over each other and they don't come back again. Which means that if you actually tried to get a soprano, an alto, a tenor, and a bass to sing it, you'd get into trouble because the bass would have to end up as the alto, and the soprano would have to end up as the tenor, the alto would have to end up as the bass, and the tenor would have to end up as the soprano. And we do know one singer in Chicago who can sing soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, but he's quite unusual. And so usually people can't do that. This explained to me the, the, it's the internal structure of the piece, and it's a very extreme abstraction of the piece of music, where I've forgotten every detail apart from where the lines of music are in relation to each other at any given moment. And once I had drawn this, I understood the structure so that I, could, I feel I can play it better. Now, the thing is that you don't have to see that picture in order to listen to the piece of music. Just like you don't have to know where the structural walls are in this building in order to use the building. It's just a good thing that someone knows where the structural walls are in the building. And this is the thing, that when you understand the math inside a system, when you understand how something works, you can use it better. You can fix it better if it's broken. You can make your own versions that do the things that you want to do. People say to me, I get by perfectly fine without math. And that's fine. I say to them, you may well get by perfectly fine without math, but I get by better. So, I'd now like to talk about something different, which is juggling. And I used to say, oh, I'm terrible at juggling. And someone said to me, that's what people say about math. And I thought, oh, dear, it is, isn't it? So I went home and I thought, well, maybe I just need to practice more. And I suddenly discovered I could juggle. I'm still not really good enough at it to want to do it in front of an audience. So I'm wondering if there's somebody here who would be able to do a juggling demonstration for us. Hooray! Thank you very much. Come on. Everyone give a round of applause. I have some juggling balls. Hello, what's your name? Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Here you go. Go ahead. <laughs> Hooray! Now, would you, would you mind walking across the stage while you juggle? Sideways. Uh, turn this way and walk that way. Hooray! Okay, so, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask Jonathan to do that again. And this time, imagine you have a long exposure camera. So we're going to take a photo of him walking and juggling. So each ball is going to make a path through the air. Can you imagine what the long exposure picture will look like? Thank you very much. A round of applause for Jonathan. That was beautiful. So here is a long exposure picture I made using some illuminated juggling balls. This was not me juggling. When I tried to do it, it was awfully wonky. And so this was a nine-year-old boy at the school where I was doing this. Here's one that I made digitally. So if you imagine that I'm starting over here, here comes the most hilarious slow motion juggling demonstration. I have the green and the red balls in my right hand. The green one starts going across like this. And as it's going, the red one comes underneath it. And as that's going, the, the red one, uh, the blue one comes underneath it. The red one comes underneath the blue one. Then the green one comes back on. So it, so it, uh, it makes this picture. And if I turn it this way up, then you can see it's just like the braid in my hair. And mathematicians study braids as mathematical objects, and they ask questions about how tangled up they are and what would happen if you wave them around a bit. So I, one day I thought, well, what about this Bach braid? How about I try putting this Bach braid in my hair? And you might be able to see that that doesn't work at all, because you would need a band in so many different places. Is my laser pointer going to have any effect? There it is. So you would need a band. You would need a band here. You would need a band here. This green strand and the black strand just kind of floating around doing nothing. The red and the blue ones are interlinked. But you could just pull the green one down, and the whole thing would look different. And so mathematicians study these, these objects and say, well, if I did pull that green one down, and it, it causes the same thing, what other things could, could I do? What other braids could I make that look different but are really the same? Whereas with the normal braid that we put in our hair, 
It only needs one band to hold the whole thing together because it's so looped together. If I take the band out and then pretend I'm in a shampoo commercial, then the whole thing comes out. I kind of always wanted to be in a shampoo commercial when I was little. So I didn't, I, I discovered I couldn't braid my hair like that, so I made it into a pie instead. This is my Bach pie. It's banana and chocolate. So now on to something that's more obviously mathematical, factors of 30. So we can try and remember what all the factors of 30 are. They are 1 and 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30. Very good. It's not very interesting. It's, <laughs> it's a bunch of numbers in a straight line. We often do things in straight lines by mistake because we live in a three-dimensional world. So we write on two-dimensional pieces of paper in one-dimensional straight lines, which means that we have to obliterate the natural geometry of situations in order to force them into straight lines on the page, when really they want to have some other natural structure. I like to say this is why I don't like tidying up the paper on my desk, because it has natural geometry in three dimensions. It doesn't want to be forced into one dimension. Anyway, we can find the natural geometry of this situation situation by looking at which numbers are also factors of each other. And we can draw a kind of family tree showing their interrelationships. So 30 is going to be at the top as the kind of great grandparent of this situation. And 6, 10, and 15 go directly into 30. Now, 5 goes into 10 and 15. I'm not going to draw a line all the way from 30 to 5, just like we don't tend to draw lines in family trees across two generations. And then 2 goes into 6 and 10, 3 goes into 6 and 15, 1 goes into 2, 3, and 5. And now we see that it's a cube. And this is a much more interesting thing, I think, than a bunch of numbers in a straight line. And it's a cube a different way up from the way that we often think about a cube, because it's standing on one corner. And we get to see a different symmetry of the cube from usual, where you see that the three numbers at the next level up are, in fact, the prime numbers. And they, if we spun the cube on that corner, those three corners would spin around on one level, and the other three would spin around at that level. And it's related to that little pointless conundrum, well, cute conundrum, about if you took a cube and suspended it from one corner and then submerged half of it in water, what shape would it make on the surface of the water? And the answer is a hexagon. And you can see that the hexagon would be in between the 2, 3, and 5, and the 6, 10, and 15. It would go through the three faces at the front and then the three faces at the back. So this is finding the structure inside the factors of 30. And this is actually a, a project that I do with the art students. And it actually gets them, are there any of my art students in the room? Well, Oh, hi! And you can verify that, that students get actually interested about discovering what the factors are of numbers, where previously it was just some dull exercise that you do in middle school. And we discover the different shapes that come out and how you get four-dimensional hypercubes. And that, that four-dimensional hypercube we discovered in, right in the middle of one of my art classes became part of one of the art installations I did at the hotel EMC2 because it just draws you into that world of math without you really knowing what's going on. But it's also related to the previous thing we were talking about. So I'm now going to regard this really as a cube, and I'm going to wrap it up with ribbon. So I'm going to make up my own rules for wrapping up the ribbon, because in math, you can actually make up your own rules. You can make up any rules you want, as long as you don't cause a contradiction. And even if you do cause a contradiction, then you just end up in the zero world. That's OK. You can just start again and go into a different world. So I'm going to say that the ribbon coming in from the right is going to be on top. So I'm going to follow the pattern of those squares down there. And now I need a third color to come in across the right, and it's going to be green. If I do the same thing on the other side, with the same colors starting in the same places, I'll have the red and the blue, which now have to come down first, and the green one goes across there. But if you stare at that and think about shuffling the, the strings around like we did in the previous picture, I hope you can see that if I kind of shuffle the red and the blue crossing down a bit and bring the green strand up, then the one on the left will become the one on the right. And that shows that those are the same braid. And this is a very important move in the field of not theory. It's called the third Reidemeister move. Mathematicians like giving fancy names to things because it makes us feel clever. But really, it's just about wrapping a present up. And the amazing thing is that 
These braids turned out to be a very, very deep part of my research, but I didn't know this when I first drew the braid for that Bach prelude, because I drew that when I was still a master's student and I hadn't started my research yet, and I'd never seen mathematical braids before. And then one of the first papers that my PhD advisor gave me to read when I started my PhD was Coherence for Braided Monoidal Categories by Joelle and Street. And these pictures came up and I went, what? That's the same as that thing I drew on the Bach prelude. And then years after that, when I discovered this relationship, I thought, wait, why didn't I do this to my Bach braid? So here, we started with a cube and we wrapped it up with ribbon. So how about I start with the ribbon and I reverse engineer a present that is the exact right shape to be wrapped up by this ribbon. So I need one square for every crossing. And I stared at this one day for a while and I thought, I think it's a cube. And so I frantically tore up some pieces of paper and I made it and it is indeed a cube. And then I did exactly the same thing as I do whenever I prove an actual mathematical theorem, which is first I went, oh no, it's a cube. And then I thought, I thought, I'm probably wrong. And then two seconds after that, I thought, I expect everyone in the whole world knows this apart from me. And then two seconds after that, I thought, it's probably trivial. And so um, I checked it wasn't trivial, so I thought maybe every braid makes a cube, and that's not true. That I thought, you definitely need six faces for a cube. I thought maybe every six crossing braid makes a cube, and that's not true either, because you could take two strands and go cross, 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 and that wouldn't be a cube. I don't know why this is a cube. I phoned my friend, the same one who can sing soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, and I said, oh my God, it's a cube. And, and he said, I think it's because Bach was communing with the spirit of the platonic solids. <laughs> and bless him, I don't think that's what it is exactly, but maybe at some level he was. He, that's what people think of as genius, that some mysterious connection happens between one thing and another. I don't know why it's a cube, but I don't think it matters. I just think it's really cool and that that sometimes is enough for things and that sometimes the applications come years later, sometimes hundreds of years later, sometimes thousands of years later. And if we ask for something to have a practical use all the time, we'll never do foundational research and we'll never make the progress that is needed for, for progress to happen in the future. Okay, so moving, moving off that, uh, that little call for fundamental research, Battenberg cake is one of my favorite kinds of cake. It's a very British cake. It's, the, it's something maybe to do with the crest of the Battenbergs. Maybe that's apocryphal. The point is that you have two colors of cake, and you definitely don't want the same color of cake to touch the same color of cake, because that would be terrible. So you have to have this pattern like this, but it's also a mathematical structure. For example, we could make a little multiplication table of one and negative one. So up here in the top left-hand corner, we're going to put one times one, which is one, usually. And then we're going to do next to it one times negative one, which is negative one. And then here we're going to do negative one times negative one, which is one. So it's a Battenberg cake. We could also do this for adding even and odd numbers. If you add an even number and an even number, you get an even number. If you add an even number and an odd number, you get odd. And if you add an odd number and an odd number, you get even. So it's a Battenberg cake. We can try doing this for multiplying real and imaginary numbers. Now, maybe you don't remember, or maybe you never knew what imaginary numbers are, but they're that thing that happens when they say to you in school, okay, you can't take the square root of a negative number. And then the next year, they go, okay, now we're gonna take the square root of a negative number. <laughs> the answer is it's imaginary, but it doesn't really matter what it is. It's a Battenberg cake. So a real number times a real number must be real, and a real number times an imaginary number is Imaginary, and an imaginary number times an imaginary number is, is real, so it's a Battenberg cake. I think this also explains what we should do about tolerance, and people sometimes get worked up about this, because if you're trying to be a tolerant person, does that mean that you have to tolerate everybody, including intolerant people? And I don't think that's right. I think that to be tolerant, you should obviously be tolerant of tolerant people, that you should be intolerant of intolerant people, if you're, if you're intolerant of tolerant people, then you're intolerant. And if you're tolerant of intolerant people, then you're intolerant. But if you're intolerant of intolerant people, I think that's part of being tolerant. <laughs> I think tolerance is a Battenberg cake. This also takes us to 
bed flipping, which is why I think I've given everybody a little piece of paper with A, B, C, and D on it, which is supposed to represent a mattress. Of course, bed flipping is what you're supposed to do every, every season or something to stop your fat bottom from pressing into the same part of the mattress all year. I, I don't do it ever because I'm much too lazy. But if you were going to do it, obviously you would write A, B, C, and D on your mattress to remind yourself where you are, right? So the idea is that there are various different moves we could do, and then we can make a little table about it. So there's zero, which is do nothing because you're lazy. There's rotate, which I'm calling rotate without actually turning your mattress over. Then there's flip, which I'm calling flipping over sideways. And then there's flop which is the really floppy one, which is extremely difficult if it's an actual mattress. So we can see what happens if we do each of these, these things. If we do nothing, and then we do nothing again because we're me, then you just stay in the A position, which is what I'm calling the starting position. If you do nothing and then rotate, you get into the B position. So that's a B going to be there. If you start again in the A position, do nothing and flip over sideways, you get to C. And if you start again in the A position and flop over, you get into the D position. Now, going down the side, the first column is the same because you're just doing nothing afterwards instead of doing nothing before. And doing nothing, it doesn't really matter when you do it. You can do it anytime you like. I love doing nothing. So that's the same down here. So now let's try doing a rotation and then another rotation. If you start in the A position, do a rotation and then another rotation, you get back to the A position. Now let's try doing a flip followed by another flip. So if you do a flip and then another flip, you again get back to the A position. And now we can try doing a flop followed by another flop. So if you do a flop and then another flop, you again get back to the A position, which tells us that you can't keep doing the same move every season because you'll keep getting back to A and you'll miss out the other places. So now let's try more excitingly combining some moves. Let's try doing a rotation followed by a flip. So we do the rotation, and then flip over sideways, we get to D. And then we can go back to the A starting position, do a rotation and then a flop. You do a rotation, and then a flop, C, right? Then we can try doing a flip and then a rotation. Starting the A position, flip, and then rotation. That gets us to D. Now we get to the whole point of the exercise where I get to say flip, flop, which is a B, and now maybe you start spotting a pattern. So what do you think goes on the bottom row where we would do a flop and then a rotation? What do you think goes there? C, probably. And what do you think goes here? B. And that's a good guess. Now, because we're good mathematicians and not people on the internet, we can check to see if we're right. I'll tell you that we are right. Uh, the main question now is how many Battenberg cakes can you see? Well, there's two here that are the same as each other. There's two here that are the same as each other. There's one in the middle, but there's this big one. The whole thing is a Battenberg cake, each of whose individual cakes was already a Battenberg cake. I call it the iterated Battenberg cake. Here's an iterated Battenberg cake that I made. Here's the letters written on it to show wh which is which. So we've iterated the process of Battenbergification. Mathematicians are just like small children who like doing the same thing over and over again. If we can do something again, we just will to see what happens, mostly. So Battenbergification is like painting by numbers, where you just need to know what's going to go in position one and what's going to go in position two. So it could be yellow cake and pink cake. It could be chocolate cake and more, more chocolatey cake, because chocolate cake's good. It could be a bunny and another kind of bunny. Uh, now Battenberg if I had a bunny. It could be a Battenberg cake and another kind of Battenberg cake producing the iterated Battenberg cake. If you try and make one of those, you end up with almost more cut-off cake than actual cake, and then you make lots of friends. So there is an even more abstract way I could represent Battenbergification, because in the end, all I had to tell you what was, was what was going in position one and what was going in position two. So I might as well just draw it like that and tell you what's going in positions one and two. So it could be yellow and pink. It could be light brown and dark brown. It could be bunny one and bunny two. It could be cake one and cake two. But what is cake one? 
Cake one was just one of those, and cake two was one of these, so I might as well take that whole picture for cake one and put it over there. And I can take the whole picture for cake two and put it over there. And this is now the most extreme abstractification, is that a word? It is now, of the iterated Battenberg cake, where I've taken out all the information apart from what the things are that are going in. And this is another kind of mathematical object called a tree, because it looks a bit like a tree. It has roots and it grows up into leaves. Mathematicians get into strange arguments about which way up their trees could, should go. Some people think that trees start in the sky and grow down, but I think that mostly they grow up like this. But the, the good thing about an abstract tree is that you can regard it either way. You can take it as something starting at the bottom and splitting up, or you can take it as some separate ingredients starting at the top and coming together to make one whole. And so trees, in fact, do come from sticking things together. And for example, we can look at these two trees where we're sticking three things together with one branch on the left, but on the other side, we've got the branch sticking on the right first. So we could try doing this for, say, addition. We could do four add four, which is eight, and then we could add two on afterwards, which makes 10. We usually, because we're stuck writing it in a one-dimensional straight line, we have to put parentheses in. But it's really this two-dimensional tree structure. On the other side, it says add the four and the two together first, which makes six, and then add the four on afterwards, which makes 10 as well. And we have to put the parentheses on the other side. And maybe you know this as the associative law for addition. But it's really just about moving this branch from left to right across that tree. Uh, the thing is that when we're studying things more interesting than numbers, it doesn't necessarily work quite like that. For example, if you mix egg yolks and sugar together, and then you mi mix it with milk and heat it up, you get custard. The other way around, if you mix sugar and milk together, and then you mix it with egg yolks, you do not get custard. <laughs> so these things are not equal in the kitchen, whereas some things are. For, the, for cake, it turns out that my, the recipe I grew up with says cream the sugar and the butter together first, then add the eggs, and then add the flour, and then you get cake. But it turns out that, especially if you have a, a blender or an electric mixer, then you can just kind of bung everything in a bowl and go and it'll be okay. With higher math, you get to kind of decide whether things count as the same or not. So I actually took all these cake ingredients into one of the art classes once, and we tried it. Here are all the different ways of, of sticking those branches together. So this one down here on the left is the usual one. The next one up says, mix the butter and the eggs together first. That's quite odd. And then mix the sugar and the flour after. So the one at the end says, mix the eggs and the flour together first, which is also very strange, and then mix the butter and the sugar the one at the bottom needs two bowls, because you say mix the sugar and the butter in one bowl, mix the eggs and the flour in another bowl, and then mix the results together. So if you're really lazy like me, you don't want to wash up an extra bowl. But what we discovered was that if you mix them hard enough, then it all comes out more or less the same, actually. It depends how much you care. So I actually did this with uh, the Culinary Institute of America one time. We don't have ovens at the School of the Art Institute, but they do have ovens at the Culinary Institute of America. So we baked the cake. And what turned out to happen was that these two over here rose more. That one at the bottom was a little bit more flat, like a, a hockey puck or something. And the thing is, I quite like dense cake, so I don't mind. But if you like really tall, fluffy cake, maybe you care. But they were all sort of cake. Maybe if you're the one doing the washing up, you care that there's two bowls. Maybe you have a dishwasher. Maybe you care that your cake batter goes through a phase where it looks like vomit. <laughs> These are questions that we ask ourselves. And this is actually something in higher dimensional category theory, which is my field of research, that you wouldn't usually see unless you were doing a PhD in category theory. But it's really just about cake. And the next thing that you might ask is, what if you want to make chocolate cake? Because you always do want to make chocolate cake. And if you do make chocolate cake and you draw out all the possible ways of doing it and stick them together, you get this shape, which is called an associahedron. And somebody, somebody 3D printed this for me after they saw it in the book. There's a little cutout, so you can cut it out and make it for yourself. It has uh, five pentagons, or maybe six. I, I'm not very good at counting pentagons like that and some squares joining them together. And this is something that I 
see a lot in my research, and my research deals with what happens when things don't work out quite like that. How far off are they? Because things in math are not just about right and wrong. Things, about, things are more about in what sense are they right, and in what sense are they less right? So if mathematics is the logical study of logi how logical things work, my research in category theory, I like to say that category theory is the mathematics of mathematics. So if we unravel that, it is the logical study of the logical study of how logical things work. And maybe you think that that's very, very looped up on itself and too abstract. And even some mathematicians say that category theory is somehow too abstract. But the way I think of it is this, that we're trying to shine light on more things to illuminate the situation. And if you shine your light very close up, you'll get a very bright light, but you'll illuminate a very small area. If you raise your light up a bit, the light will get dimmer, but you'll start to illuminate a broader area. And the more you raise it up, the more area you'll illuminate, but also the light will get a bit dimmer. But at the same time, you'll see more of the context of what you're doing. Of course, if you go too far up, then you'll eventually not illuminate anything at all. So you shouldn't go too far up. The question is, what is the right level to get to? And I'm not suggesting that mathematics can explain everything in the world. I don't think it can. What I think is that mathematics and logical thinking should be at the core of all the things we know, because that's where things work the best. And for me, the aim is to put more and more things in there, put as much in there as possible. But actually, the things I love the most, like the piece of music and like in art and food, the things I love the most are the things that we can't quite explain using logic, that are just beyond the boundary of what we can explain at the interface between the logical and the inexplicable. And I have this image that the more things we put inside that logical part, the sphere of it gets bigger and bigger. And as it does, the surface area gets bigger. And so we get more and more access to those beautiful things that are just on the interface. Thank you. I believe that we have some roving microphones and that if anyone would like to ask me some questions, I'd be happy to take questions. So if anyone has a question, uh, please line up over here. Um, the room's too dense for me to try to get in between the rows to hand around the microphone. Um, so again, if you do have a question, uh, please come up here. Uh, don't shout out your questions, even if you're in the first row, because uh, everybody won't hear them. We have a question from online first oh, while, while we're waiting for people. Um, can you give us an example of what other mathematics programs could be a good idea for the public? Of what other mathematics programs could be a good idea for the public? That's a wonderful question. I think that, that there's so much research mathematics that has nothing to do with the things that you see in high school that if more research mathematicians shared their love of whatever they're doing, then I think that would be great to widen everyone's view of what math is. Because the view that it's about solving specific questions and numbers and equations is so limiting and it puts people off. Whereas mathematicians study shapes and surfaces and the way that things interact with each other and draw spectacular pictures. And I hope that more, gradually more and more mathematicians will feel compelled to share their love of what they're doing. And I think that people are seeing that it's so important. I think the traditional model of academia is that you do your research and you try and get big grants and win prizes. And that's the thing that is mostly appreciated by certain research universities. But I think it's becoming more and more recognized, especially as new young generations come in, that, that sharing what we do is crucial, because otherwise, why are we doing it? And that, that passing on the knowledge that we have to future generations and everybody, especially if we're at public funded universities, is particularly important. M music was part of mathematics mm -hmm. until actually quite recently. And there is a, a, a phenomena, an, an observation that, that is very uh, troublesome, and that is the Pyth Pythagorean comma. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that you cannot go to the same place going by, by fifths or, or by octaves. The, the numbers don't, don't match, and that's like a, like a tragedy, something really very serious. Can you comment on that? 
Uh, yes, thank you. So for, for those of you who aren't already familiar with this, the question is, it comes down to harmonics on a piano, or on any instrument in music, because waves, sound waves, have certain um, lengths, and then if you half the length, you get something that's supposedly an octave higher. And if, every time that you vibrate a string that's fixed at both ends, it doesn't just vibrate with this wavelength, because you can also make the wavelength that's half as much, because the two ends will still be fixed. And then you can also do the one that's a third as much, because if you make a sine wave that's a third as much, the two ends will still be fixed. So you get a whole series of harmonics at half, a third, a quarter, a fifth, and so on of the wavelength. And so if you do that, then you get very, very beautiful notes that sound together perfectly because they're resonating in, in perfect uh, resonance with each other. Uh, the thing is that if you do that, as you go around the fifths, if you know any music, you go around the cycle of fifths and in theory you come back to where you started. So if you start at C, you go... and then you land at C again. But the math of that doesn't work out because the math of that says that you're doing two thirds times two thirds times two thirds a certain number of times and that you should get back to half. I did that the wrong way off, it's three over two. Anyway, what it comes down to is that you end up with something that should be two to the, a half to the power of something equaling a third to the power of something, which is impossible because you can't do two to the power of something equaling three to the power of something because one of them's even and one of them's odd. And so what that's telling us is that, that the piano isn't really tuned like that. And that's the thing that, that was the tuning issue of before, because if you make your fifth perfect, then you can't also make all your other intervals perfect, because they don't fit together in the octave properly. So this is to do with the fact that Western music decided to pick seven notes as its, as its um, way of splitting up the octave. I think that people were really obsessed with the number seven at some point. It was a mystical number. That's why the rainbow is divide, divided into seven colors, although none of us can actually tell the difference between indigo and violet. That's completely made up just to make it seven. So we also split the, the octave into seven notes because of the same mystical reason. And it sort of almost fits, but doesn't. And so in order to make it perfectly fit, to divide it into 12 equal half notes, you have to take the octave, which is a double length, and you have to make it into ratios of 12. It's not, a, it's not dividing it into 12, it's making it into ratios of 12. So that if you multiply the ratio 12 times, you will get two, which means you have to take the 12th root of two. And that is a difficult mathematical problem if you don't have a calculator. And until recently, people didn't have calculators. And apparently, there's, I can't, no one knows if this is entirely apocryphal, but some guy in China did it on a 120 column abacus or something and got the 12 through to 2 to some number of decimal places. But it was those advances in mathematics that caused people to think about how to get the, the thing to be tuned evenly. So now pianos are not tuned perfectly. They're all slightly off from the harmonic tuning because if you made it perfect in the harmonic tuning, there'd be dreadful notes. There'd be notes that sounded so bad. Some of the notes would sound better, but some of the notes would sound truly terrible and you could never play in that key. And so what we do instead is we spread out the terribleness so that every single interval is equally terrible and that mostly you can't really tell. But when piano tuners tune pianos, they listen for the, how off it is. And if you listen really carefully, you can hear the interference of the, the notes because they're not exactly in resonance. They're slightly interfering with each other. So they're still, the, the Pythagoreans were the ones who held to this beautiful ideal of having perfect fractions of things. Um, I'm not a Pythagorean. I don't really care about perfect fractions on my piano. I do like playing the violin though because on the violin you can still make the perfect intervals because you just shift your finger a little bit and then you can tune it how you want and ch keep changing it in any moment. Whereas on a piano, you're stuck with it the way that you've done it. And there's also a harpsichord over there, and harpsichords tend to be tuned more Pythagorean. And harpsichordists, if you ever meet them, see them get together, you can suddenly see them get really excited about what type of tuning system they're using, and they'll go off on some long excitement about that. And that's why when singers sing together in perfect tune, it's more satisfying than listening to a piano, because they, if they're really good, can adjust their tuning so that it, it is harmonically perfect as they go along. Whereas on a piano, we can't do that, but it's always a trade-off. There are other wonderful things we can do on a piano other than that. Uh, I'm not really sure if that answers your question, but it's an answer to a question. <laughs> okay, we have a, a question from Emmy, who is nine years old. Oh. At, at what age did you start to learn piano? 
Oh, I started to learn the piano with a teacher when I was five, but I started actually playing before that because I had an older sister, and I don't know if you have a big sister, but I had a big sister and I wanted to do everything she did. And so when she started playing the piano, I was determined that I wanted to do it too, but we couldn't find a teacher who was prepared to teach me when I was three because everyone thought I was too small. And so I just sort of stole her music and, and plonked myself on the piano seat, so I'm just going to do it anyway. And then when I was five, we found a wonderful teacher who would have taught me when I was three because she could tell that I was more than ready to do it. But then I started having lessons, and I just loved it all the time. I loved the fact that I could play beautiful music. I loved getting better at it. I loved not being told what to do. And I loved the fact that I didn't have to be constrained by you know, anything someone ringing a bell and saying, now it's time to go and play some game or something. And so I always just loved playing. OK. What are your favorite children's books that are mathy? Oh, my favorite children's book that is mathy is, uh, well, one of my favorites is the one called A Million Jelly Beans. And I love it because it's two little characters saying, I wonder how many jelly beans is too many. And one of them goes, oh, I think that, that 10 jelly beans is way too many. And they said, yeah, but what if, we, what if we had 100 jelly beans? We could just eat some every day. And then they start thinking about how many they could eat in a year. And it goes on, and they gradually think about 1,000 jelly beans. And there's a picture of 1,000 jelly beans. And then 100,000 jelly beans. And they finally think about a million jelly beans and think about if they, how long it would take to eat them. And then there's this it's kind of a spoiler. Well, anyway, the last page, the last page is a big fold-out picture, which obviously I haven't counted, but allegedly is actually a million jelly beans. And I was amazed, because I don't know if I've ever knowingly looked at a million things. And so this page has to fold out, because it's really big, and then you're just staring at it, and there it is, a million jelly beans. So I like that one. There's a new one that I read about recently, uh, about infinity. I can't remember what it's called. Maybe someone here remembers. It's, so, it's a, a little girl who asks all her friends and family what they think of infinity. She's staring at the stars or something, and then she gets lots of different feelings about infinity, which I think is wonderful, because there's not enough feeling in the way we present math, I think, to especially small children, because we all like to feel things, and if we feel things when we learn them, then we'll learn them more deeply. So I'm, I'm sorry I can't quite remember what the title of that book is, but maybe one of you wonderful math people can remember or quickly look it up. Dr. Che, if you were suddenly made the czar of math education in America, and you were asked, what changes would you make in primary schools and high school mm -hmm. to their high school and primary textbooks, what would those changes be to get us all as excited about math as you are? Thank you for that question. Um, this is this is a big question, it, and um, I know there are many wonderful math teachers around who do a great job, and unfortunately, not everybody gets one of those wonderful math teachers. One of the things that I would love, I think, is that if there were specialist math teachers a little bit earlier on in the education process. Because one thing that, that my art students tell me a lot is that they loved math in kindergarten and in first grade when you're kind of playing with things. But then at some point in middle school, maybe third or fourth grade, they started really hating it because it became about memorizing things, especially times tables. It became a lot about right and wrong became competitive, they started feeling bad about themselves. And I think the problem is that at that level, there are often teachers who are general elementary school teachers who have not become general elementary school teachers because they have a particular affinity for mathematics. People who are particularly good at math are more likely to become math specialist math teachers a little further up. And the trouble is that if then you're taught math by somebody who doesn't really like math themselves, then that is going to become transmitted. And already at third and fourth grade, there are math questions that children can ask that are really difficult. And so if a teacher is not comfortable, you either have to be comfortable saying you don't know, or you have to be comfortable with that exploration. I've worked a lot with six-year-olds, because I've done voluntary work in schools in England for many years, with six-year-olds. And I always chose that age, because I felt like it was such a crucial age. And they could ask me questions I couldn't answer. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing about math. They could ask me questions that blew my head out, and I'd walk home going, I do not know what is going on there. And I felt OK with that, because I know that I am a mathematician, and that's all right. So I think that having specialist math teachers earlier on, 
to do to in order to get that we have to have more appreciation for the amazing work that teachers do and of course it would help if we paid them more so that people wanted to do it but also if we respected them more as a society because they're so important for everything that we do and gave them more autonomy over what they do so instead of having somebody coming in and saying this is how math should be taught and then all the teachers have to frantically learn this new way of teaching math if instead teachers are allowed to teach the things that they believe in, I think that's more important than mandating exactly how it's done. And mandating has to be done if you want to make sure that standards don't drop. And you have to make sure that standards don't drop if you don't trust your teachers. So if we could somehow get to a system where we trusted our teachers to teach the things that they believed in and teach them well, and became less obsessed with meeting certain targets. So I think that we get people to meet certain targets, like maybe they're supposed to know all their times tables and they're supposed to be able to solve certain equations by a certain age. Well, what exactly is the point of that if they turn out to hate it and then forget it as fast as possible in retaliation? And so I think that we then achieve something that is basically futile, plus we've done, we've done worse than achieve something because what we've achieved is we've turned off a whole lot of people from mathematics. So I've seen that described somewhere as the bulimia model of education, where you learn lots of stuff for a test and then you vomit it all out. And this is very unfortunate. And I think if instead we, we promoted more discovery of mathematics rather than mandated results and encouraged children to carry on learning through play, because in kindergarten and first grade there is a lot of play, and I think it, it quickly gets eliminated because you're supposed to do symbols. Math is a very serious subject and you have serious textbooks and symbols. And maybe if the teachers don't think that math is a form of play, then they won't be able to teach it as a form of play. So I think having that keep going, of course there's a balance you have to meet because there are people who do want very serious technical math and they want to go into science subjects and become become scientific people. And we have to make sure we don't leave them behind either. But at the moment, I think that we're treading an unfortunate trying to keep a balance between people who might become mathematical people and people who get turned off math and that we're not really serving either group particularly well. And so I think letting go of having to achieve certain standards would be another thing that I would, would definitely um, appreciate. And one of the wonderful things about my dream job at the School of the Art Institute is that we have no grades which is wonderful. It's a completely grade-free school. It's just credit and no credit. And when I teach, there is absolutely nothing mandated for what I have to do. I can teach anything that I believe is teaching my students to think better. And I really appreciate being given that autonomy. I was never given that autonomy in any other university system. And so I know the feeling, and I think that I can teach better because I'm given that autonomy. Thanks. What is your best advice for communicating math to a more general audience? My best advice for communicating math to a general audience is to show what you love about it. Because it's not about trying to make people understand things at a high level. I think sometimes mathematicians can be, first of all, they can be too obsessed with trying to make sure people understand difficult things. Secondly, too many people derive their self-esteem from being able to do something that other people can't do. And then they're not really motivated to show it to other people. Because if they let other people in, then they will lose that power that they have of being special, of being able to do something that other people can't do. And we see this at all levels. We see this in research seminars, where it's not really always the dumb thing to give an intelligible research seminar, because then people might not think you're very intelligent. And so it's better to give one where no one understands you, and then everyone could go, wow, that's very deep. Um, and this is not productive, I think. So I think that as a basic starting point, finding what you love about it and sharing that, if the love of it is the first message, then I think that is a much more compelling message than a whole lot of technical details that, that might, might go over people's head. What was your greatest insight of math and studying category theory? What was my greatest insight of math in studying category theory? Well, category theory is a lot about relationships between things rather than their intrinsic characteristics. And I think the big message of category theory is that it's really important to study things in terms of how they are related to other things, not just in isolation, and that everything should be understood in its context. And I think this has a very broad 
ramification for how we should understand society as well and how we should understand other people. That people aren't just isolated incidents. Nothing is an isolated incident. Everything is a conglomeration of lots of different things, the way that things interact with each other. And if we can understand the whole system of interactions, then I think that gives us much more insight than just understanding something's isolated characteristics. So I want to start re-educating myself in math. And mm -hmm. where do you suggest I begin? Well, there's this great book I heard about. It's called How to Bake Pie. <laughs> and the thing is that I'm asked that question a lot. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I didn't feel that there was a book I could fully endorse that I really believed in. And then I sort of woke up one morning and thought, oh, that means I should write it, doesn't it? And so that's what I've started doing. And so I wholeheartedly, in fact, recommend uh, that book as a good place to start. That is entirely why I wrote it. What advice do you have for mothers to encourage their girls to learn and study mathematics and stay excited about it? Oh, that's a great question. And I think it is that, of course, that's a whole, a whole other Pandora's box, the question of girls and underrepresentation in mathematics. I do think it's very important for them to see it coming from mothers. And the f I think that it's not a coincidence that I got most of the math from my mother and that my father is, is a, a child psychiatrist and a very intuitive person. And that sort of gender reversal between all the intuition stuff coming from my father and the very, very logical, rational, clear thinking coming from my mother, I think was very helpful for me to not feel gender pressure and never to feel that it was something that I couldn't do. I think that if... If it, some parents I can see, have seen, some of them are my friends, who get into a state where it's the father is the mathematical scientific one and the mother says, oh, I can't do any of that. And I think that that is a very, uh, it's an unfortunate message to give to children. And the thing is that I think a lot of, I see a lot of parents who are afraid of doing math with their children because they don't know the answers. And the thing is, you don't need to know the answers. It's okay not to know the answers. Because first of all, you can ask Google. Google is wonderful. And... Um, <laughs> And Wikipedia is really quite good for math. It, it rarely gets afflicted by people just randomly trolling and saying the wrong things. But math, and research mathematicians rely on Wikipedia quite a lot, actually. Uh, so if there's a question that you can't answer, then you can say, well, that's wonderful. You have a question that I can't answer. Let's see if we can find out what the answer is. And then show that math is something that is a continuous process of discovery. I once did a talk to some five and six-year-olds, and one of them put his hand up and said, how long did it take you to learn all of math? <laughs> and I said, I said, there's no way anyone can know all of math. There's much too much of it, and I'm still learning. And I saw all their eyes widen because they thought math was something like this, that you get to the end of it, maybe when you graduate high school or something. And so I think understanding that it's a continuous process and, that, and especially that being confused isn't a bad thing. The trouble with the idea of math geniuses is that everyone can get the idea that math is just something you're supposed to know, just like that. And maybe you remember that person, that kid in your class at school who just knew all the answers immediately. And that's really annoying, because math isn't about knowing all the answers immediately. This thing I'm trying to prove at the moment, I've been doing it for 10 years. It's a little bit frustrating, but it's great. And, and I, if you're confused, then it's an opportunity where you might be about to get cleverer. And if you're never confused, then you're never pushing your brain to its boundaries. And if you always know all the answers, well, you're probably deluded. In fact, the people who think they know all the answers are deluded. But, but pushing yourself to the point where you're confused is all about getting your brain to become stronger and to be able to do more things. And the brain is more elastic than I think people like to think, that you're not just a math person or not a math person. Everyone can get better at it. And parents, I think, can get better at it with their children. If they don't understand what their children are doing, that's great. Then they can all discover it together. We're going to take two more questions. I love that you did math with your mother. I do math with my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what your favorite math memory with your mother is, or favorite time. Oh, thanks. I have a couple of favorite math memories, but the, the earliest one I remember is when she told me for some reason about sketching graphs. And she told me that you, squaring numbers can be turned into a graph. And I, my, as we say now, mind blown. But my mind was blown by this idea that the process of squaring could become a picture. How can it become a picture? And I think that this amazement gets lost when we teach graphs to children later on in school because it's like, you know, sketch this graph. No, you did it wrong. Sketch this graph. Sketch this graph. Sketch this graph. But it's just, let's just pour 
pause and think about how amazing it is that the idea, some idea like that can be turned into a picture that encapsulates that idea. And that is a really big part of what math is. And that's why it's very related to art, which is also about capturing ideas in some way that is illuminating. And my mother told me about this. And I remember sitting in our big green armchair at home. And I was very small, and the armchair was enormous. And I just thought, my brain is contorting itself out of its skull. I felt like it was going like this. And that is the same feeling I still get now when I'm doing mathematical research. It's that my brain is getting outside of its skull somehow and going all over the place. And I think that for many people, if they feel like their brain is doing that, then they think they're no good at math and they should stop. But I want to encourage everyone to feel that that means that they're really thinking mathematically and that they're becoming cleverer. And that, that becoming cleverer is a really wonderful thing to do. Hi, just uh, I realize, you know, um, and thank you for speaking in regards to children and math. I do have two wonderful children. Um, but one of the things I went through, I actually, before um, finishing my associate in college, I took my math classes in my, my last semester, and my class was, you know, super boring. Um, and I heard out of the sudden uh, students said, this is why I hate math. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, actually, math is so much fun. You know what? I'm changing my major. I want to be, be majoring in math because mm -hmm. it's not as boring as it looks. So um, I understand about uh, children, how you know, keep them engaged. But how do you uh, go about like college students to uh, re-engage them in math or to make them fall in love with math for like the first time? How do how how is the way that we can address that for college students? I think I think that there's an unfortunate aspect of college education where often. Calculus is a thing that is compulsory, and that as long, once you've done calculus, phew, you can stop, phew. And I am from the UK, as you might be able to tell. And in the UK, we don't have the same kind of obsession with calculus. And I still don't quite understand why calculus is the thing that is the thing here, because I think it's quite an odd place to try and get people excited about math. And I think that there are other subjects that would be better, for example, category theory, and or this great book I just heard about. And that's why I was so excited to teach this course to art students, because I had always dreamt of teaching a liberal arts math class that, in my dreams, that would be the required math class for everyone as an undergraduate. And I never had the opportunity to teach it. I tried and tried, and I could never persuade my university because they thought it was more important for me to teach math majors and it would be a waste of resources or something to teach math to non-math people. So I just wrote the book and thought, well, I'll bypass the whole system and produce the book anyway. And then, amazingly, the opportunity to teach it at the School of the Art Institute came up. And I thought, oh, I've already got the textbook. And so I think that there are things other than calculus that are much more fascinating ways to draw people into the world of mathematics. And I wish that we could do that instead. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank Dr. You. Shang will be out there signing books for you. Thank you very much.